felt threatened by an Iraqi's presence, we should just shoot them and the officers would quote unquote take care of us. By this time, many of the Marines who were on their second or third tour had suffered such serious psychological trauma, having watched friends die and lose limbs, uh, that because of these experiences, they were moved to shoot people who, in my opinion, were clearly non-combatants. There was one incident when a roadside bomb exploded, and a few minutes later, I watched a Marine start shooting at cars that were driving down the street hundreds of meters away and in the opposite direction from where the IED had exploded. We were too far away to identify who was in the cars and they didn't pose any threat to us. And for all I could tell, uh, as I was standing about 20 meters away from the Marine and about 300 meters from the cars, they were just passing motorists. It was long enough after and far enough away from the explosion that the people in the cars might not have even known that anything was going on or that anything had even happened. But the Marine was shooting at them anyway. Uh, this Marine had had his best friend get killed on our last deployment and had also related to me a story about the two-day firefight that I mentioned earlier, when he watched the commander who had given us the order to shoot anyone on the street shoot two old ladies that were walking and carrying vegetables. He said that the commander had told him to shoot the woman, and when he refused because they were carrying vegetables, the commander shot them. So when this Marine started shooting at people in cars that nobody else felt were threatening, uh, he was only following the example that his commander had already set. I don't have anywhere near enough time to tell you every related experience that I had in Iraq. But in general, the rules of engagement changed frequently, contradicted themselves, and when they were restrictive, they were either loosely enforced or escalations of force, as shootings of civilians were known, were not reported because Marines did not want to send their brothers in arms to prison when all they were trying to do was protect themselves in a situation they'd been forced into where there was a constant, ambiguous, and deadly threat, and any citizen of the country that they were supposedly liberating could have been wearing an explosive vest. With no way to identify their attackers and no clear mission worth dying for, Marines viewed the rules of engagement as either a joke or a technicality to be worked around so that they could bring each other home alive. Not only are the misuse of rules of engagement in Iraq indicative of supreme strategic incompetence, they are also a moral disgrace the people who have set them should be ashamed of ourselves, and they're just one of the many reasons why the troops should be withdrawn immediately from Iraq. Former Marine Sergeant Jason Lemieux, he served three tours in Iraq from 2003 to 2006. He currently heads the Los Angeles chapter of Iraq Veterans Against the War. If you'd like a copy of today's program, you can go to our website at democracynow.org. More testimony in a minute. I'm Sheed Sharifi here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we return now to Winter Soldier, eyewitness accounts of Iraq and Afghanistan. My name is Jeff Millard. I'm the Washington, D.C. chapter president of Iraq Veterans Against the War. I spent nine years in the New York Army National Guard. Thirteen months of that was spent as a sergeant in Operation Iraqi Freedom, stationed at Forward Operating Base Spiker the majority of that time. At the end, of my tour of duty and at the end of my military career, I went UA for nine months. They mailed me my honorable discharge in May of 2007. It's no surprise for anyone who's been in the military since September 11th, especially not for those of us who have been deployed since September 11th, that the word Haji is used to dehumanize people, not just of Iraq and Afghanistan, but anyone there who is not us. 
We bought Haji DVDs at the Haji shops from the Hajis that worked there. The KBR employees that did our laundry that were from Pakistan became Hajis. The KBR employees who worked inside of our chow halls became Hajis. Everyone that was not a U.S. force became a Haji. Not a person, not a name, but a Haji. I used to have conversations with members of my unit, and I would ask them why they use that term, especially members of my unit who are people of color. It used to shock me that they would, and their answers were very similar almost always, and that was, they're just Hajis, who cares? And that came from ranks as low as mine, sergeant, all the way up to lieutenant colonel in my unit. The highest ranking officer that I ever heard use these words was the highest ranking officer at, during my deployment in Iraq, General Casey. During a briefing that my unit, the 42nd Infantry Division Rear Operations Center at Fob Spiker gave to General Casey, I heard him refer to the Iraqi people as Hajis. I've heard several generals, including the 42nd Infantry Division Commander, General Toledo, and my own general that I worked for, Brigadier General Sullivan, used these terms in reference to the Iraqi people. These things start at the top, not at the bottom. These, I have one story that I want to share with you. One of the most horrifying experiences of my tour that still stays with me was during a briefing that I gave. It was actually in the early summer of 2005. For those who've deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan, we know that a year becomes a month, a month becomes a day, and a day becomes a second, a second that repeats over and over and over again, not just for your tour, but the rest of your life. So I wish I could name the exact date, but unfortunately, that day has become a second that is repeated and repeated and repeated. But on a day in the early summer of 2005, in the area of operation of the 42nd Infantry Division, there was a traffic control point shooting. Traffic control point shootings are rather common in Iraq. They happen on a near or daily basis. What happened was a vehicle was driving very quickly towards a traffic control point. A young machine gunner made the split second decision that that vehicle was a threat, and in less than a minute, put 200 rounds from his 50 caliber machine gun into that vehicle. That day, he killed a mother, a father, and two children. The boy was age four, and the daughter was age three. Now, I was in the briefing that evening when it was briefed to the general. And after the officer in charge briefed it to the general in a very calm manner, Colonel Rochelle, of the 42nd Infantry Division, DISCOM commander, turned in his chair to the entire division level staff, and he said, and I quote, if these f***ing Hajis learned to drive, this shit wouldn't happen. I looked around the talk at the other officers, at the other enlisted men, mostly higher enlisted. As a sergeant, I think I was the lowest ranking person in that room. And I didn't see one dissenting body language one disagreeing head nod, everyone was in agreement that it's true. If these effing Hajis learned to drive, this S wouldn't happen. I couldn't believe it, but it was true. That stayed with me the rest of my tour. I looked around every time that word Haji was used, and I thought about that soldier who will carry that with him for the rest of his life, and I thought about the four Iraqis whose bloodline was ended on that day. And Colonel Rochelle could not think of any of that, but only his own racism and dehumanization that has started at the commander-in-chief of this war and worked its way down the entire chain of command. I would like to thank my fellow panelists 
and everyone who has testified and offered testimony that will not be heard publicly for Winter Soldier, Iraq and Afghanistan eyewitness accounts of the occupation. It has been the utmost honor, more honor than I ever gained from putting on a uniform to sit up here with the greatest patriots of American history. Thank you. Former Sergeant Jeff Millard spent nine years in the National Guard, served 13 months in Iraq. He heads the Washington, D.C. chapter of Iraq Veterans Against the War. Former Sergeant Domingo Rosas testified next. My name is Domingo Rosas. I was a sergeant. I was deployed to Iraq with the 3rd Armored Cavalry Division. 